is an important uh, thing to know uh, regarding in the world today, and uh, the Baha'i situation in Iran is really an important one. Uh, to, to focus on that, I have, uh, okay, I have here, I just thought, okay, uh, maybe everybody has a, has a copy of the press release that the Baha'i community sent out regarding this current situation. I thought what I'd do is I would uh, refer you to this. We're going to read this because it really is the, the key point, and then explain how we got here. Uh, and how and why the Baha'i community has been persecuted, and then uh, talk about why the situation uh, with the Baha'is in Iran and its and its uh, its uh, global impact. Um, so uh, let's 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 go to the, the the press release because it it does talk about what is going on and how the United States has played a role here. Okay, now. Uh, as of September, uh, this is dated today, it says, but it's September, the U.S. House of Rep Representatives unanimously passed a resolution condemning the, uh, the government of Iran's state-sponsored persecution of the Baha'i minority and its continued violation of the International Covenants on Human Rights. This was introduced by Congresswoman Leela Ross Lightman on behalf of herself Congressman Ted Deutsch and Robert Dold, Elliot Engel and Steve Chalba, and Congresswoman Jan Sablowski. Now, this House Resolution 220, which I'm going to quote for uh, a, a bit, gained strong bipartisan support. Of the 152 representatives sponsoring the resolution, 62 are Republican and 90 are Democrats. The resolution calls on the President and the Secretary of State, together with responsible nations, to condemn the ongoing persecution of the Baha'is in Iran and to demand the release of religious prisoners, including seven Baha'i leaders who have been sentenced to 20 years in prison. Their sentences have now reportedly been reduced to 10 years. The resolution specifies several examples of economic hardship imposed by the Iranian government and experienced by the Baha'is in Iran, including the dismissal of over 10,000 Baha'is from government and university jobs since 1979, the confiscation of residential and commercial property, and the denial of access to higher education for Baha'i youth. That is the primary focus of my talk today, but I think it's important to realize that this is the context under which the Baha'is are being denied their right to an education. Further, the resolution urges the President and the Secretary of State to utilize measures, quote, to impose sanctions on officials of the government of Iran and other individuals directly responsible for serious human rights abuses, including abuses against the Baha'i community of Iran. Now, this doesn't dismiss, dismiss that other people might be having problems, but the Baha'i community is the largest group in Iran religious group in Iran. Congresswoman Ross Leithman stated, quote, Iran's Baha'i community is a frequent target of the regime, subject, subjecting adherents to arbitrary arrest and, and harassment, refusing to recognize, recognize Baha'i marriages, and destroying their cemeteries and holy places. Economic repression is also severe as Baha'is are prohibited from public sector employment why public, private employees are pressured not to hire them. Congress makes it clear that it's not forgotten about the suffering of the Iranian people, condemning the regime's repression and its notable persecution of the Baha'is, while urging the State Department sanction, to, to sanction the officials for responsible human rights abuses. You turn over the other page, the other side. Congressman Deutsch stated, quote, the Baha'is continue to face persecution and repression of the most basic human rights. The Iranian regime not only banned members of the Baha'i faith from opening, openly practicing their religion, but prevents them from holding employment, frequently seizes their property, and suppresses opportunities for Baha'i youth. The unanimous passage of the re this resolution of the United States House of Representatives 
will continue to speak out for the rights of religious minorities and will continue to condemn human rights abuses. These statements are significant in the wake of a letter penned by the Baha'i International Community addressed to Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. In this letter, Bani Dougal, the president representative of the Baha'i International Community, points out, quote, this economic apartheid against a significant segment of Baha'i's popu of Iran's population has undeniable negative consequences for the economic dynamism of the, of the country and has ultimately deprived Iran of considerable human and financial resources. How will history judge those who designed and carried out this scheme of economic strangulation? So that is the focus uh, of, of my talk. And that uh, really is the kernel of, of what I'm talking about. And uh, there's a long history uh, in, in this regard. Uh, but I thought I'd show, before I get to the more serious part, uh, a little uh, video that uh, one of the Baha'is, uh, uh, young Baha'i youth put out. It was sort of a, a campaign where they wanted to let everybody know, being youth, of course, they wanted to do something a little unique. And what they did was uh, they wanted to show that uh, let's let everybody know. And so they put together this little video. Um, and again, this is about the Baha'is uh, denial of uh, ed education. But as you saw, it's far more complex than that. It's a whole series of systematic um, oppression by the government. Um, and we'll describe a little more of that later. But let me show you this brief little short video, and that'll sort of um, show you uh, the uh, gist of it. So, okay, so you see, the youth, the, the youth are pretty involved in this, uh, because it's their future. Uh, the young Baha'is around the world and non-Baha'is who are active in, uh, in, uh, in this campaign uh, bring to light uh, the oppression of the Baha'is in Iran. So how did, how did we get to this situation? What, what was it that created this? what apparently seems to be a sudden uh, awareness of this situation. Well, the Baha'i faith began in Iran, and uh, it's, it has a complex relationship with, with the social and religious structure of Iran. Uh, I'd like to quote uh, two paragraphs from a Baha'i scholar, a professor of sociology who is a Baha'i, and, uh, and talks a little bit about what, what happened and how the Baha'i faith began and how the repression continues. Well, he says, in the middle of the 19th century, the world of Shia Islam was in a state of fervent messianic expectation. 
devout believers were awaiting the advent of a holy figure known as the 12th Imam, who had been in concealment for a thousand years. According to the prophecies recorded in the traditions, when the hidden Imam reappeared, he would arise as a Qayyim, or and he would unleash a jihad, a holy war, on the forces of evil and unbelief, and would usher in the day of, resur uh, of judgment and resurrection. But when a, in 1844, a mild and refined 25-year-old merchant from Shiraz, Persia, declared that he was that promised figure of Islamic prophecy, it set a shockwave throughout Persian society. His name was Sayyid Ali Muhammad Shirazi, and he took the title of the Bab, or the Gate. Response to the Bab and his teachings ranged from aesthetic embrace by those who became his followers to hostile and violent rejection by the government and the clerical hierarchy. Determined to get rid of the newborn religion, the authorities launched a campaign of brutal persecution, culminating in the execution of the Bab himself before a firing squad in the Barrett Square of Tabriz in July 9, 1850. But the Bab made an even more startling claim. He had claimed that not only was he the Qayyim of Islam, but he also claimed to be both a new prophet and the herald to yet another messianic figure greater than himself, referred to as him whom God would make manifest. The essence and purpose of the Bab's own mission, as the Bab would always say, was to prepare the people for the second advent. In, one, in 1863, one of the Bab's followers, Mirza Hussein Ali Nuri, Baha'u'llah, was publicly proclaimed to be that promised one. In the century that followed, the religion Baha'u'llah uh, founded, the Baha'i faith, would attract adherents far beyond Iran and the Middle East and would become a world religion with millions of followers around the globe. So the Baha'i faith began in this tumult of religious fervor. But as the Baha'i faith uh, began spreading around the world, in Iran, the government would begin various campaigns of suppression of it in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the 1940s, in the 1950s. There was another. And the campaigns kept going. Uh, before the current campaign and the 1979 revolution, when most of the world was hearing about Iran, the Baha'is were again subject to an even bigger uh, 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 wave of persecution. But the, but the attacks on the Baha'is weren't no longer religious. They couldn't hide their uh, hatred of the Baha'i faith as simply religious. They began to add political elements. because people were already beginning to see that it was just a religious persecution. So what did they do? First, because the Baha'i World Center is in Haifa, Israel, they, they said that the Baha'is were in cahoots with the Israeli government. So this kind of silly thing is actually based on, the, on a very simple fact. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, was exiled from Iran, first to Constantinople, then to Adrianople, then finally to the prison city of the Ottoman Empire in the prison city of Akka, where he was put in prison. Every time they kept exiling him, the, a little Baha'i community would go. But his last exile, where he last stayed, would eventually become a center place of where the Baha'i World Center would be. But the Iranian government kept saying, kept saying that the Baha'is were in cahoots with the Israeli government. The next charge that it would, would make against the Baha'i community was that it was un-Islamic, that it was anti-Islamic, and that it was hostile to Islam. Well, that is simply silly, because the Baha'i faith once came out of the Islamic religion. In fact, Western Baha'is show more respect for the Prophet Muhammad and Islam than many people realize. And it has done a lot to remove the prejudices and stereotypes of, is, of, of, of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. But why was this? Because the Baha'i faith teaches that each of the world's religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all come from the same root. And they're all part of a progressive revelation of God. But 
since the Muslims believe that Muhammad is the last prophet and that there are two prophets after Muhammad, this, this kind of uh, uh, facade that the Baha'is are anti-Islamic looks kind of silly on the face of it. The other claim that, uh, that uh, a, a very <coughs> famous man known as William Sears wrote in a book known as Christ in the Heart during the 1979 to 80 persecution um, was that the last uh, uh, charge was that they were spies for Israel. This silly charge just doesn't make any sense because the Baha'i holy places are in Israel and the Baha'is go on pilgrimage to there. Now, there are Jewish places, there are Christian places in Israel. People will on pilgrimage. But to say that the Baha'i, because the Baha'i world center is in Israel, because Baha'u'llah was exiled there, just doesn't make any sense. So, again, this kind of thing looks kind of ridiculous on the face of it. But unless one were to say that this is surely the result of, of inter-squabble between two groups, recently two pro a group of prominent Muslim intellectuals recently spoke out against the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran. Um, a group of Bangladeshi Islamic uh, intellectuals wrote a letter to the government of Iran saying that they were appalled by the persecutions. They wrote, and I quote, the fact that the Baha'is are a peaceful community and the largest minority of Iran and being subjected to a premeditated program of hostility, especially by the government, who have closed the doors of all social and economic opportunities, including jobs, education, and security, for them is contrary to the norms of any civilized society. That's un absolutely unacceptable. Then, if that, that weren't enough, this group wrote, Criticism and rejection of the beliefs or sect of any religion cannot justify violence or tyranny against its followers, they wrote. And I quote, Islam supports freedom of religion and belief. The Quran has affirmed the, this important point in several verses. The Muslim leader continues, one prominent ayatollah in Iran wrote, took, there's a very beautiful, uh, tradition in Iran of Islamic calligraphy, of writing beautiful calligraphy. He himself took a, a, a beautiful quote from Baha'u'llah, consort with the followers of all religions with friendliness and fellowship, and put this in a calligraphic artwork and gave it to the Baha'is of the world. This itself shows that the Baha'i uh, uh, persecution is being, uh, is is, is no longer just religiously justifiable. Even a respected Muslim theologian in France called the Baha'i uh, persecution a disdain of law, an intolerable scandal. So this persecution is not, is not can no longer be used with fake uh, uh, reasons or political uh, machinations, and even Muslims themselves are appalled at it. So that is alone rather fascinating. But the United States, the United States uh, House of Representatives have, in 1982, 1984, 1988, 1990, 2009, 2012, and 2013 passed House resolutions denouncing the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran. The latest one is House Resolution 220. Let me quote from it. It says, Congress has declared that it deplored the religious persecution by the government of Iran of the Baha'i community and would uphold the government of Iran responsible for upholding the rights of all Iranian nationals, including members of the Baha'i faith. And here's another quote from that resolution. Whereas the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom report in 2014 stated that since 1979, authorities have killed or executed more than 200 Baha'i leaders 
and more than 10,000 have been dismissed from government and university jobs, and more than 700 Baha'is have been arbitrarily arrested since 2005. So, this is in the congressional resolution that the House passed last September. Now, of course, the Baha'is are very hardened by this, but in each paragraph of this resolution, the, the Baha'i situation is thoroughly discussed. Uh, let me read another one. Whereas the Department of State in 2013, the International Religious Freedom Report stated, Baha'is are regularly denied compensation for injury or criminal victimization and the right to inherit property. Now, this is just amazing by itself. The government of Iran goes to its own citizens, goes into their homes, goes into their whereabouts, and either takes away their, uh, their, uh, their property, uh, denies them their businesses. Recently, as I mentioned in this, uh, uh, as is in the flyer, the homes of 30 Baha'i businesses were shut. Why were they shut? They were shut because they just simply wanted to close their, um, house, uh, their businesses for Baha'i Holy Days. These people were put in jail. Um, now, during the 1979 revolution, you see, in the Baha'i League, there's no clergy. I'm a, an elected member of the Spiritual Assembly of Detroit, so these people are elected. It's a lay religion. But what happened in Iran was even more fascinating. What the government did was it, it told the Baha'is that they could not have their local administrative bodies. Then they could also not have their national spiritual assembly, that is the nine people who were elected. So, what did it do? What did they do? Suddenly, the Baha'is of Iran elected their national spiritual assembly and they disappeared, they vanished. So what did the Baha'is in Iran do? They elected another national spiritual assembly. And what happened? They too suddenly vanished. Then the government of Iran banned uh, Baha'i administration totally. So the Baha'i said, this is the law of the land. We are, okay, we'll follow the law of the land. Then the Baha'is could simply not get together and worship. So, then what happened? Later on, just recently, the Baha'is who are going to university were expelled from university. Why is this? Why, are, why would a government not allow its primary, one of its own citizens, not access to education? Well, the answer is simple. If the, if the individual is a Baha'i, they are, they have no life. And in, in Iran, there is no recourse. You can't go to the television station and say, you know, the, what the government has been saying about us is not, is not right. Over there, the government and the, and the clerical hierarchy are one. The Baha'is have no recourse. So what the United States government is doing is very helpful and we appreciate it a lot. Uh, let's, let me read from another uh, quote here. Um, um, this is dealing with the uh, Baha'i setting up their own. It was known as the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. Um, this is from the uh, House Resolution 220. Whereas in the beginning of May 2011, officials of the government of Iran in four cities conducted sweeping raids on the homes of dozens of individuals associated with the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. And they were arrested and detained. Several educators. They are now serving four or five year prison terms. So, this this is astounding that a government would do this to its own citizen. A government that claims that it's following the high standards of Islam, which are uh, 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 in the Quran itself, are denying human rights to its own citizens. Now, uh, as House Resolution 220 said, whereas the Baha'i international, uh, international Community reported, that there has been a recent surge of anti hate propaganda in Iranian state-sponsored media outlets, noting that in 2010 and 2011, approximately 22 anti-Baha'i articles were appearing every month. And in 2014, the number of anti-Baha'i 
article of what rose to approximately 411 per month, 18 times the previous level. So it seems that the religious establishment in Iran, this wasn't enough. The government got involved and now is uh, continuing and intensifying the persecution. Uh, but let me pass around and show you, you can see here, uh, the list uh, of the number of people who have been killed by the government of Iran. What was their crime? What did they commit? What did they do? They simply pro professed to be Baha'is. That was their only crime. In Iran, possessing Baha'i books is enough to get you in jail. What is your, um, what is your affiliation? You're denied education. You're denied housing. You don't have the right of legal status. One of the Baha'is, uh, one of the uh, lawyers, a Muslim lawyer who was defending the Baha'is in Iran, was herself put to jail for uh, helping the Baha'is in court. This kind of thing is, 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 can be given the cloak of religious justification, but everybody's seen through it. Many Muslims, as I've read, are now themselves speaking out against this. So the key part here is that now the, the Iranian government doesn't seem to realize the Baha'i faith is a world religion. It's not just in Iran. It's in every country of the world. So they can say, well, uh, we're doing it here. But throughout the Middle East, uh, the Baha'is are having other difficulties. And we don't mean to, to dismiss that other people in Iran are having a hard time, too, under the current regime. But the Baha'is are the largest, the biggest. But they're officially not recognized by the Constitution. So when you're not recognized legally, you have no legal status. You have no rights. You have no right in court. You have no right to go uh, to any place. Um, the, um, the house of the mob, the holiest house for the Baha'is in Iran was demolished and turned into a parking lot. So the government of Iran continues this with the justification that the Baha'is are, uh, are uh, uh, they're just, they're, they call them the corrupt on earth, they call them uh, various sorts of names, uh, but they don't want to recognize them. And it all comes from down what was this historic a problem. But as, you, as I read to you, even Muslim intellectuals are now denouncing the, the way the Baha'is are being treated in Iran. So what, 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 what can the uh, Iranian authorities do? How can they justify its treatment of its, Iranian, of its fellow citizens? What government does this to its own citizens that it doesn't allow them housing, doesn't allow the people to get uh, uh, an education, denies university students and children. Elementary children have been harassed. Your parents are Baha'is. Uh, uh, you should denounce them publicly. So this kind of uh, harassment continues. So, resolved that the House of Representatives condemns the government of Iran's state-sponsored persecution of its Baha'i minority and its continual violation of the International Covenants on Human Rights. It calls upon the government of Iran to immediately release seven imprisoned Baha'i leaders, eight imprisoned Baha'i educators, and all other prisoners held solely on account of their religion. It calls on the President and the Secretary of State in cooperation with responsible nations to immediately condemn the government of Iran's continued violation of human rights and to demand the immediate release of the prisoners held solely on account of their religion. So that, that is uh, basically uh, what I've come to tell you. Uh, the persecution continues. Now, it is continuing in other parts of the Middle East, but in Iran, it's the most intense. Um, it is the most coordinated. It is organized by the government and, what can one say, a peaceful community that simply wishes to live with its Christian, Jewish, and Muslim neighbors who simply wish to live among them in peace are being denied legal and religious rights. So, are there any questions? I'm sorry, I had to duck out for a few minutes, so you may have covered this. About how many Baha'i live in Iran and about how many worldwide? I'm not, uh, there are about six to seven million 
throughout the world um, uh, in, various, in, in various countries. In Iran, I'm not sure the exact number, uh, but it is the largest group in, in, in Iran. And, uh, but there are six to seven million. Um, and, um, yes. I'm sorry, yes. So you, you told us uh, that there is uh, this discrimination in housing, we're denied housing, I believe that, but I'm wondering, in terms of how they're going to be able to meet their needs daily, how do they get around that? Do they end up as household servants? Well, is there a ghetto? Do they have to squat? What is it? Well, those that, the house haven't, haven't been invaded, or they haven't been, uh, um, uh, are, are making do. We see, when, when the people go to relief, the only place they can go is generally to the mosque or other places. So it's harder to get, uh, to get assistance. Uh, human rights groups are helping, but uh, it's been uh, pretty uh, minimal at this, at this stage. Are, are they like, you know, is there segregation uh, spatially? Segregation in terms of religion uh, is, is common in Iran. I mean, it's all based on a religious system there. So, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, that is part of it. But uh, uh, again, uh, when, you're, when you don't have legal rights, uh, it's hard to sort of, you can't go to court and say, well, well, usually the justification for some behavior, if you say, well, Somebody borrowed money from somebody. Well, that's a Baha'i. We don't have to. We don't have to return his money. Uh, 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 oh, uh, your 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 uh, your aunt was Baha'i. We, we don't have to. We don't have to do anything about that. So it's sort of like there's benign neglect, and then there's active suppression. So it's sort of like both. One, they sort of are uh, are given sometimes some things, and others. It's it's sort of a game. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks for your talk. You, you mentioned a couple times that there, there's no recognition for the Baha'i faith in Iran. Does, does Iran recognize any other faith besides it, the, the Constitution of uh, uh, Jews, else? Christians, and Zoroastrians, some of various Muslim sects, but the Baha'is, which are the largest, are not are all recognized. No. no. Uh, officially, the Constitution allows Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. Uh, that's it. Questions? Yeah. Um, okay, so they don't have any uh, access to legal representation in, in Iran. But um, this is a, a global matter. Is, are there any? international courts, any uh, extra Iran legal entities that they could appeal to and well, I, I, human international courts? Of there's, there's nothing within the country that is... That, 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 oh, so, I, yeah. I get that. Yeah, nothing yeah. within the country. Within the country. I think there are uh, church groups and stuff that have, have quietly helped, but uh, uh, basically, it's, there's no other legal staff, there's nothing extra legal, no, no, there's no other, uh, everything is... And there's no international legal body? Uh, well, the United Nations Human Rights Commission and mm -hmm. others and have, 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 have condemned it, but there isn't anything that has been done internally in Iran. They've, they've condemned it, they've made good statements, but nothing has been done about it to the government. What, what specific dif differences are there between the Baha'i religion and the Muslim religion that would provoke such intense discrimination? Well, it's largely because the, the Muslims believe that Muhammad is the final prophet, that there could be no prophet after Muhammad. Baha'is as I mentioned, they have two prophets, a man known as the Bab, spelled B-A-B, who we believe is the promised one of Islam, and the Muslims don't accept that. But that's how the Baha'i faith started, within the Muslim faith itself. And then Baha'u'llah, there are two prophets that we believe came after Muhammad. For, for, uh, for many of the uh, clergy, 
that is beyond the pale. So they want, that is what provoked the whole uh, uh, campaign since the beginning, since the 19th century into the 20th, into the 21st. And that has dominated it uh, purely a religious hostility. But then they try to mask it over with various political covers or with various other things because as I said, many Muslim intellectuals in other countries are not are seeing past this as a pure and a pure religious uh, oppression. So I thank you. Yes. No, just like one last question since we have a little time. Uh, I'm guessing that the religion was founded then in, in uh, yeah. Iran by an Iranian. Founded by Iranian Muslims in an Iranian in, in, in Iran itself, it was began in Iran. It started in Iran. See, they, they, one of the other things that they sometimes say was the Baha'i faith didn't start in Iran. It started. They make up some some other stuff, or it was made up by the Israelis, or it was made up. It, it, it's always another reason, but the real historical reason is it started in Iran by Muslims themselves who later accepted this and the faith took off. Mm -hmm. Then once it took off as a world religion, the Baha'i faith within Iran is not officially recognized, even though it's all over the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I am aware also that the Baha'i is an amalgamation. No. Like they, they incorporate the, the teachings of a lot of the other world religions. Which one of those prophets, is there a book that the Baha'i faith Yeah, yeah, okay, the, the okay, let me book? explain that. Okay, the Baha'i faith believes that each of the religions come from the same God. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, we believe they all came from the same God. Okay, we believe that they just came in a progressive historic order. So. It's not that, that the Baha'i faith are amalgamating it, it's just that we believe that, like, like Christians believe in the Old Testament. That doesn't mean they're Jews. They believe that the Old Testament validated the Christian religion. Muslims believe that Judaism and Christianity were valid religions, but they uh, just didn't come to accept Muhammad. Well, the Baha'is say, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they're all valid, but we have a new revelation. So it isn't that we're, we're, we're saying that they're an amalgam, but we believe they came in a progressive historic order. We call this progressive revelation. Is there a book? Yes. Baha'u'llah wrote over 100 books. There are, there are the scripture of the Baha'i faith, in addition to uh, the previous holy books that the Baha'is accept. Baha'u'llah and the Bab wrote scripture, and that forms the basis for the Baha'i community. So in the Baha'i temples, uh, scripture from the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hinduism, Buddhism even, are read. But the Baha'i scripture is, also, is what is found as the basis for the Baha'i community. So um, that's how it, it, it functions. Well, I thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you very much.